Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And we need to talk. We have to talk. We need to talk. So Michelle, we need to talk. Yes. 1925, we introduced the Like album. But before, we have an interesting story about Oscar Barnack. I want to hear it. And Oscar Barnack, before to join um, Lights, he worked for Zeiss. And he worked for a project that nobody take care about. When he came to uh, Lights in uh, 1911, he has uh, a job to build a movie camera, 35 millimeters. He was a film buff. Yes, he was both film and photo. But at this period, sorry, at this period, uh, Oscar uh, was hired and he has to build a camera movie, 35 millimeters. And then he built it. But he built it on a certain way. He reduced the size, make it in metal, reliable, and in this camera, we understood how he built also the Leica U. At the beginning, the Leica U, the name was Lilliput. Yes. Yes. Lilliput. Small. Yes. And Ernst Leitz, with Oscar Barnack, they discussed about this. And Lights, Ernst Lights, was very interested by this project. And he asked him to continue to develop this project. So let's just take a, a stop here for a minute, because he had this camera at Zeiss, but Zeiss was not particularly interested in this. Yes, that's the story I heard about. Yeah. And when he came to Lights in 1911, he continued this Lilliput camera and Ernst Light was interested in it and he asked to, er, to Oscar to continue to do something with and then in 1914 we had the Leica U yes the first prototype and Ernst Light use it in the US we have pictures we have the negative he took picture with this camera and it was fantastic. And he said to Oscar, continue, we have to see what we can do. This is, this is so wonderful. Now I understand that Oscar's first use of this camera was to check the film sensitivity of movie film because it was so variable back in the day, is that right? Yeah, there is two stories. Okay, so we have to decide which one we like better. This one is one. And of course, another one was that he has some problem with his back. We're talking about Oscar now. Oscar, yes, yes. that he had asthma and he has yes. asthma, and he loves also he loves to make picture. Yes, and he tried to find a way to have something lighter than he had to do before. And he had to use. Well, back in the day, we're talking 1913. The compact camera was a four by five inch speed graphic. Yes. Much it bigger. It was heavy. Yes. You had plate, you had tripod, you had one speed, you had aperture was not so big. And so it was complicated. Know. Yes. And you had long time exposure. Yes. And Oscar looked for an ID to do something with something smaller, but to have good picture. And then, of course, he used in the 35 millimeters film for cinema, he used the same frame, 18 on 24. But the quality of the image was not so good as it was. This is so interesting because from the very beginning, is it not so that his idea was just like film, this image, the still image, the photograph would be enlarged. Yes. rather than the contact prints which yes. were in vogue at the time. Yes, and then he looked for an ID. So film cinema is uh, with this uh, sense. Vertical. And vertical. And he had the ID to double the size of the image of the cinema. And then it becomes 
24 on 36. And he turns it sideways. Yes, on that way. And even today, the full frame is 24 on 36 because it's a good format. So he invented a compact camera and it was a success, not immediately because in 1925 we had the war before. Right, so this went on hold from 1914 to 1918. There were other things yeah, to do. Yes, so uh, every company, every country, enfin, it was a catastrophe. Yes. And then in 1924, the prototype was finished and Ernst Lights with the board number said we have to take a decision and all the members didn't want to have it because it was a huge investment for the company. And they didn't have a camera before this. They were a microscope manufacturer, precision optics manufacturer. Yes, but we started to build lenses in 1894 mm -hmm. with a duplex lenses, 220 millimeters. Interest in photography from Ernst Lights was also for micro photography to be able to take picture what it was possible to observe with the microscope. Yes, of course. And uh, then they developed with Carl Metz some lenses in 1894, the duplex, but also the periplan after and the summa to equip some big format uh, camera. And then the really incredible idea of uh, Oscar to make something small because Ernst Leitz was very interested also about a new product. Yes. And don't forget that in 1907, we introduced our first binoculars before camera. Interesting, I did not know that. Yes, and these uh, uh, binoculars is still very strong with Leica. We are at the top of uh, these uh, products also today. I, I know, I have a uh, Trinovid 8x42, which is not quite the same as your 8x42. Uh, the Noctivid. Uh, yes, uh, we will talk about that yes. a little bit later. Uh, yeah. But in the meantime, let's continue the history because I'm, I'm struck by the corporate or the company DNA or the mindset of Ernst Lights. He found someone, a young man, who was very competent. He brought him in and he gave this young man room to maneuver. Yes. That's a big deal. Yes, because Ernst Lights, he took care about people. He was one of the first to introduce insurance. Yes, health insurance. Yes, for, for their people. 10, 12 years before it became a uh, law yes. in Germany. Yes. But it changed also something very incredible that workers, they have to work, to, to work 12 hours per day. That's a long day. And he understood that he cannot have good people doing good things during 12 hours per day. And 10, 12 years before it became the law, introduced for lights worker, eight hours per day. I Just to understand the, 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 the philosophy of uh, Ernst Lights. I could sit on this subject for days because that corporate DNA continues to exist to this very day. Earlier this afternoon, we took a tour of the facility here and it is the antithesis of the traditional factory worker where there are dozens, hundreds of people hunched over a machine with incredible time pressure doing one small thing. These people look like what they are, craftsmen and women, yes. artisans. Yes, So At each step we have people behind to control and to make the other step. Yes. So now let's fast forward because as we were going through the Leica HQ, the gallery, when we come in, you were taking us through the cameras. Yes. So after we have the Leica, 
1924, first introduced at the Leipzig Fair in 1925. Yes, and it was not a big success because people said, well, it is so small, we cannot have good quality to compare with big format. That and, sounds very familiar even and, today. And Ernst has a good idea. He gave some product to some incredible pro. They use it and they promote it. And then we have the success. And also, just to give you an idea about the family, the Ernst Light's uh, uh, thoughts, they created the Leica Academy, the Leica School, in 1938. Yes, very early to teach people how yes. to use the camera. And how we to have today in mainly all our subsidiaries like our academy for workshop, for customer, but also for our people to learn and to train, to be trained and to use the, the camera. It's a fascinating story. There are so many other cameras, there are so many other stories about the people, there are so many firsts. One of the things that struck me as we were going around earlier today is you kept saying to me, we were not late, whether it was about digital or about something else. You told me that in fact Leica was operating between evolution and revolution. Now, I don't know of a camera company that doesn't say that at some point or other, but it struck me as profoundly true. So can you take us into what was revolutionary in the following years? So the, the first one was the Leica 1, of course. And until the M3 in 1954, we developed during 40 years, 34 different cameras. And we focus about customer needs. And the target of Leica was not to be a, a technology company, but to use the best and the right technology together for one aim, to get the best results. Of course, we need to know what is aperture speed, how to use it at this period. Uh, you cannot work without knowledge of. But it was the best tool to make the best image quality. That's we, 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 we never stopped that. It's, it's fascinating because the original Leica 1 of 1925 had a viewfinder, yes. but it wasn't a rangefinder. And yet at some point Leica decided or Lights decided that an integrated rangefinder yes. would serve the purpose better of getting a more consistently sharp picture. Yes. And if we look at the M3, it was a revolution because we made during 30 years evolution of the Leica 1 with the rangefinder, with interchangeable lenses, with uh, low speed, uh, uh, synch synchro flash and so on. But at the end we made everything it was possible to do. You've repeated this, I, I love that. Most people don't know that the Leica 1 through 3 had two windows. Yes a viewfinder for composing and a rangefinder window for focusing. And it is really difficult with a modern eye to look through that rangefinder window, so small and dim. Yes, but at this period, you didn't have choice. Yes, it was revolutionary. Yes. And yet you now talk about 1954 and the Leica M, and of the course... Leica M is an incredible revolution on different steps. The first one is the viewfinder, very big, very bright, and the rangefinder is in. Right, integrated. So, integrated. Mm -hmm. So first, this is. The second was the bayonet, and not screw anymore. So yes. you can change very fast the lenses. And also, with this bayonet, it gives us the possibilities also to make a lenses with a fast aperture. Big, bigger than we had also. This is so interesting to me and we talked about this as well because other camera companies which we won't name have just introduced new lens mounts, bigger lens mounts with the claim that, and it's not just a claim, it's, it's substantiated, that these bigger 
lens mounts will allow them to make faster lenses. The world repeats itself. I find that fascinating. Yes. Let's skip ahead a little bit because we now live in a digital era. Yeah. And it's true that the M4, the uh, MP, the M6, the M7, each had incredible advances and yet retained an iconic design. But I want to have you share the story of Leica being early to digital because I didn't think that that was the case. Yes, in 1996 we have the S1. The S1 was the first digital in Leica with 75 million pixels. I want to repeat that please. What was the year? 1996, if and I'm not doing a mistake. And what was the megapixel count? 75 mil million pixels. 75 megapixel digital camera in 1996. Was what was the catch? What was the catch? It, it was, was a scanning camera. Yes, yes. It was a scanning camera. We need to explain. In three colors. Mm -hmm. You need uh, nearly one minute for the red, one minute for the green, one minute for the blue. Perfect for product photography and archival art. Yes, still working in some museum. They are still using it. 75 million pixels, but we developed two other cameras with 45 and 25 million pixels, and so with a faster uh, speed. Yes. To from three minutes to uh, nearly 45 seconds. But you this camera, it was a revolution because first, it was a complete camera with a viewfinder. The sensor, the size was 36 on 36, and we can use not only Leica lenses, we can use Hasselblad or Mamiya or other brand. So it was a system open. It's exactly what we did some years after with the S2. And the S2 has a large bayonet also, and we have lenses already prepared for more than 100, 150 million pixels. So the people they are buying, or they bought the S2 in the past, and they had tomorrow a new S. They don't have to change the lenses, because the lenses fit perfectly with. You talked about this earlier in the day. It was really quite interesting how there were other digital cameras early on. The R8 and the R9 were completely Leica. They were not done in partnership with anyone else. And the R8, you developed a digital back for that. Yes, in 2004, we introduced for analog camera, a digital back and 10 million DNG. And it was also a revolution because nobody has this um, um, offer. I would say, in the market. And for our customer, it was possible to keep their body, to keep their lens, and to have 10 million pixels. Still working today. In 2002, I bought a, uh, a Canon 1D, which was 4 megapixels, and I thought that was the bomb. So a 10 megapixel camera where yes. you can retain your investment in your film body and film lenses, quite exceptional. This kind of thing, over the course of the day, keeps coming back. This combination of a corporate culture which places a, an incredible emphasis, and it shouldn't be incredible, but in this world of ours it is incredible, an incredible emphasis on the people, the value of individuals, on innovation which sometimes was ahead of the curve and sometimes wasn't really commercially successful, uh, and yet we continue. I give you an example about the M8. Yes. Many people said that we were late. We were not late. Technology didn't exist at this moment to get the dynamic of our lens with the sensor existing on the market. So we worked with Kodak during more than three years, I heard, and they developed for us because it was the first mirrorless camera. Of course. And because our problem was with the M that 
we don't have a big space and so the lights are very um, right you uh, get a vignetting because yeah, of the light waves or even dark with yes. some lenses yes but with Kodak we find other way and Kodak developed for us a CCD with a micro lens right it was the first one with the micro lens and then we were able to bring on the market not M8 digital but uh, M8 with the, the light lens quality to keep it and this is something that nobody has and another point very important the design of the body from the M4 uh, M3 sorry in 1954 and the M8 the ergonomy is exactly the same for the focus for uh, at the speed for the aperture so tradition excellence we have and at the back modernity with with the screen and because we never talk a lot about we were the first company at the beginning not to use low pass filter that's right because otherwise we are losing a lot of the dynamic of our lenses and still we are like that and many companies today they advertised about it. but m8 was in 2006 i think yes we, and we started without low pass filter i i bought an m8 as we spoke earlier i bought the 35 millimeter f2 sumapron which i loved and the 90 millimeter 2.8 uh, 2.8 Elmarit. Love those lenses. Love those lenses. But now let's fast forward. It's 2018. It is September 24th. Yes. Tomorrow, Photokina 2018 opens. Yes. Where is Leica as a company now? It's a very different product line than just a few years ago. I would like to say one thing very important. That Please. Few dealers or people they understand mainly maybe it's a fault from us but no other company in photo market photography market offer from the silix to the s2 well, s007 today uh, a complete range of product with autofocus, without autofocus, full frame, APS-C, for the format. We one have, inch. One inch. We had, we have an answer on, of any needs in photography. So we don't need to go on another brand. We can stay in Leica from a compact camera in your pocket or with a medium format with 30.6 million pixels. You know I'm going to have to get my hands on that S2 and do a little testing with it. Yes. Yes. And it's not just down to one inch because you've now struck some very interesting partnerships. Huawei in the smartphone market, yes. you're doing a dual Leica lens design in that smartphone. You had recently made an investment in the computational imaging company Light, the makers of the L16. Yes. So for as much as we talk about tradition, as much as we talk about innovation in what is now a traditional space of film. Let, 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 let me talk about Good. Pa, pa, pa. The first one was with Minolta in 1971, something like that. And because at this period we have to develop the reflex. We yes. Have the Leica Flex, Leica Flex SL, SL2 Two. and so on. But it cost money to have the M and the R system. Which, which came after the SL2. Yes. Yes. And then we worked with Minolta and we bought the body. And from them and the shutter. And we developed our own electronics and features of the camera. And this gives us the possibility to continue to develop different bodies in our system. The lenses, we put more money to develop a lot of incredible lenses in the R system. Yes. And then Minolta was one. The second, we, the first was the R3, but I think we have the Leica CL. 
for you? Yes, of course, the with compact rangefinder. Of course, with the 40 and the 90 millimeters. Yes. And uh, we sold it uh, under Leica CL in Europe, US, and Minolta sold it in Japan under the name Leica Minolta. Yes. So we had the R3 and all the R models R until... The R4, R5, yes. 6, 7, and then... Our own camera in 1996, the R8 with an incredible design, incredible, incredible design yes. and performance. We had also a flash meter, this is yes, yes. inside. Yes. You don't need uh, something by, uh, on your side. Yes. It was inside. Yes. Easy to use. I want, I want to talk with you for hours, but we are constrained. So instead, Michelle, can you say in 2018 what are the attributes that Leica stands for today? What are the three things that people should be thinking if you could have your way when they think about Leica? Well, the first thing I would say, if somebody is looking for the best results, they can go to Leica. Any lenses we are producing doesn't matter about the aperture. The quality is not coming from the aperture, the quality is the lens how we are doing it, opening at 4 or open at 95. The performance of our lenses, the best result is at full aperture, full aperture. This is very important to compare with some other. You have said that this has been a Leica design objective from the get-go. Yes. that it operates at maximum performance at widest aperture. You've also said that in the digital era, your lenses are designed iteratively, interactively with the sensors themselves. Yes. It is a yes. system. So yes. that, is, that is one attribute. Two more attributes that you would say. Two more things that people would associate with Leica. As we focus always about tradition and excellence, we add the modernity of digital things, but we kept the quality of our product. And I would say all our product, binoculars or camera, are also nice objects. Yes. When you have it in your hand, it's something different. I think of them, I actually think of them, and viewers of the channel know this, as talismans. I sometimes get annoyed with myself that I feel that way, but it's inescapable. It's, it's not an objective thing with me. It's a clear bias, but when I pick up a Leica, I am picking up history. I, I see, and I don't mean to be punny about this, but through photography, through videography, this is the lens through which I see humanity, through yes. history. Yes. And, and this is an incredible inspiration when I actually go to make images. Yes. And slides, and I would say today, Mr. Kaufman, they have the same philosophy for Leica brand. We kept past, present, and future. This and is very important. I, I agree. We, we talk about partnership. We had Minolta. We had Matsushita in 2000 with the for the camcorder from Panasonic to make the Dicomar Leica lens because, because Matsushita wants to compete against Sony with Zeiss lens in camcorder. Still exists. Yes, it does. And then in 2002, Panasonic wanted to go in the photo market and we are looking for a partner to go in digital because we are not not we are not able to do compact, but if we have to do everything in Germany, the cost will be double or, uh, I don't know, very, very expensive. More. Let's more. just say more. So, we, we continue the partnership with uh, Matsushita and Panasonic Group today mm -hmm. uh, on the same way that we share our knowledge and uh, both group, it's a win-win agreement. So this is uh, something that has existed for many years, this notion of partnership where it makes sense. Yes, now we have the 
Huawei agreement. Yes. With the P20, with the P20 Pro, the last one they launched with three lens. That I did not know. Yes, three lens, and you have a three times zoom. I did not know that either. By optical, and we have five times hybrid. And we get 42 million pixels. Ah, uh, the joys of computational imaging. And, and ju just to finish, we introduced last year, just last year, uh, another uh, uh, agreement with Novacell for the Leica Eye Care glasses. Yes. And this is a new step. At the moment, it is in Europe from uh, France, for France, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, and I'm sure for some other uh, countries uh, in the next years. The thing about the Novacell uh, agreement that was important to me was to hear you say this is not about just slapping a Leica label on it. The assertion is that the optics are actually superior. And I have to tell you, with progressives, I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out. Yes, I could. If you have your prescription, I'm sure in France we can get your glass in, two, in one or two days. I'm going to hold you to that. We have to wind this up. I want to get the third attribute for Leica, the third thing that people, you would like to think about when they think so about I, Leica. I would say something, it's the difference for, from the others. So, of course, we are in a world of competition. But when you are coming to Leica, you use a lot of different brands before. And when you are coming to Leica, I would say it's the end of your long way to use different kind of camera. And you will stay with the brand Leica. Because you can use the lenses you have on different, uh, the, the SL. We can use more than 150 oh, lenses from Leica. Stop, because now I'm just going to go off onto a tear and one of our cameras only has a 30 minute recording limit. And Claudia, you're telling me we're about to hit this. So, Michel Allaire. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us the Leica story, abbreviated. Guys, here's what I want to tell you. The Leica Park, the Lights Park here in Wetzlar is an extraordinary place if you are interested in the history of photography. And in the history of photography, you are interested in the history of humanity. It is a joy to be here. I want to come back here. And there is simply yes. so much more to say. We're not going to talk about all the other exhibits. We're not going to talk about all the other parts of it. I'm just going to say again, Michelle, thank you so much, man. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. The thing of it is, what I've learned is that my lifelong fascination, my passion for image making, photography, videography, no pun intended, stems from the fact that it is the lens through which I experience history. When I hold a Leica camera, a hundred years worth, not just of Leica history, but world history flows through my brain. And in that, it's the history of technology. It's the history of people. And in the history of people, that's really what helps me understand what this world is all about. Right now, I'm standing in the exact spot that the inventor of the Leica camera, Oscar Barnack, stood when he first tested the Leica camera in 1914. Yeah. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you soon. <laughs>